It helps your teachers understand the certain types of effective second language teaching methods that are most appropriate to the speaking levels of your learners. So if you know, I'm going to go through the stages here in a little bit, but if you know all your learners are at the novice high level, you're not going to speak to them full out in your language. Let's say you're going to go right over their head. You're going to totally lose them. How much are they going to get out of that? And so knowing this process also to guide assessment. You're going to design assessments to inform you of what your students can do with and in your language. Uh, also, it can become very overwhelming when we say, oh, we're trying to revitalize our language. And if you look at the definition of what that actually means, this guy Joshua Fishman says language revitalization means you have created three consecutive generations of speakers of your language. So that would be me, become a speaker, my children, and then my children will have children, and then they will be speakers. We won't know if that's actually the case and going to happen probably for another 20 years. Now, if that's our only goal, always we're thinking we're not successful. We haven't achieved that yet. Those kids aren't talking. Those kids in the house aren't talking. That person speaks, but their spouse doesn't talk. Oh, they took the language program, but their kids don't speak. And if we think about it in that way, it can be very deadening, flattening. It can be depressing, discouraging. So having and knowing, identifying a second language acquisition process for your language gives you benchmarks in the interim. It gives you short-term goals that you can see are achievable. And currently at Six Nations, we have lost most of our native speakers. We have two left. However, we have created 25 adult speakers who speak at the advanced mid-level on the Actifil proficiency scale. Who's familiar with the Actifil? Okay. It's a way to assess the speaking level or ability of a second language learner in any language. The website is actfl.org. So there's at the bottom, there's novice, intermediate, mid, superior, distinguished. So I'll get to it here in a bit. Um, so by having this process, you're measuring your, your success in terms of individual achievement. But we know that the achievement just doesn't belong to the individual. It belongs to your community. It belongs to your nation, your family, your clan. Everybody puts in to support these new speakers of your language. And so it, it's everyone's achievement when you have a learner who goes from the novice level to the intermediate level. It's everyone's achievement when you have a learner who goes from the intermediate high level to the advanced low, which is a very, very big step for someone who speaks one of our very complicated languages. So just a quick background. The six nations are actually comprised of six independent nations. Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Huga, Seneca, and Tuscarora. Our languages are all related. Um, we can't really understand one another when we talk. But they are related languages, Iroquois languages. So this is Six Nations of the Grand River Territory right here. This is Lake Ontario. There's Toronto. This is the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. Canada has stolen everything except for this little red patch right here. And oh, really? And then that's where the reserve is. Stronghold. Our languages are polysynthetic. Verb-based, comprised of a whole bunch of little parts and pieces. It's important to know this because what works to teach English and what works to teach French and what works to teach Spanish 
does not always work to teach Mohawk. And so there's TESOL, TOEFL, all these different organizations who are set up to teach um, world languages. Our languages are not world languages. They're very different. Whose language here is also polysynthetic? Hence, all these little parts and pieces, if you change one little part, or if you leave out an H, it means something really crazy, and, <laughs> right? You can hear the learners, sometimes they'll say them. They make the mistakes. Mm -hmm. So understanding the typology, it's called, of your language is critical in recognizing the second language acquisition process for your language. So how we came to this at Six Nations, uh, Six Nations Polytechnic is sort of similar to a university. They commissioned a study. And it was a year-long study. And they wanted to know about these people here. How did they become speakers? And they wanted to know what the most effective instructional, instructional frameworks were, what the most effective teaching and, learning, teaching and learning and methods were that got these people speaking at the advanced mid level. And if you're familiar with Actifil, that is quite an achievement. And so for the last 60 years at Six Nations, the focus has generally been on domain reclamation starting schools, starting programs, getting grant money. Um, before that, it was language rights. We didn't have to fight very hard for that because they just leave us alone. They're like, don't make those Mohawks mad. If they want to teach in their language, go for it. And so we did. Our people never asked anyone's permission. We just did it. And so we've trans kind of transformed since about 1998. Um, a Brian Miracle is here in the room. He started the Ongwawana Ganjokwa Adult Mohawk Language Immersion Program, whose sole focus was on second language acquisition. Teaching the language in an unnatural format to build and create speakers of our language. That is a huge shift. And we're about 20 years in, and it's had a great influence on language planning at Six Nations. So now there are, there's a Cuga and Onondaga adult language immersion programs. <laughs> uh, Six Nations school district teachers. There are seven elementary schools. Two Cuga elementary immersion K-8, two elementary Mohawk schools K-8, and they want to know how do we teach our kids to speak the language. So the efforts of Awanadeka, Brian, have carried over into these other domains, particularly mostly uh, elementary schools. So the study, there was 104 participants. Most of them were teachers in these immersion schools. Some of them were native speakers. And the very first thing that we found out was, OK, if we want to know how to create speakers, we actually have to take account. And we have to decide who these speakers are. I'm not sure if you can see the numbers, but native speakers, you can see Mohawk has four. Hugo has 36. And this is in 2016. So this is now down to two. This is now down to 30. This is down to four. If we look at second language speakers, for Mohawk it says advanced, mid, or higher. There's a standard. There's a goal. Someone decided somewhere that advanced mid is what is required to teach effectively in an elementary immersion school setting. It's the level of proficiency that you need to raise children in the home from birth. Now, Actifil and the World Readiness Standards, they say advanced low is their goal. We set the bar a little bit higher because we know how hard it is to create a speaker to maintain that person's level of language ability, three, to grow it, and four, for them to actually transfer that to someone else. So we've set the bar higher. We don't want to just be equal with the rest of the world. We're going to surpass. And so you can see here, we're losing native speakers. Bilingual children, 
However, for Kyuga and Mohawk, we're gaining. We're replacing them. That's the goal. So if you look at what the Hawaiians have done, they said this morning, OK, well, back in 1983, I believe, there were 2,000 native speakers and 50? Less than 50. Less than 50 second language speakers. <laughs> Today, those numbers have reversed. So the way I perceive the Six Nations language revitalization movement, we're about halfway in between that. We're trending upwards, it's called. We're actually creating more speakers than we are losing. And that's very encouraging. So the real game changer in that has been adult immersion programs with a focus on creating speakers, focusing on proficiency. So the next thing this study uncovered, I asked these 104 people, um, who's a speaker? So when we think of speakers, we think of our older people, our elders, the native speakers. And we realize that eventually, very soon, we're going to lose all of them. We're not going to have any. We have to plan for that now. We should have been planning for that yesterday. And luckily, people were. So this, the natural intergenerational transmission will be broken. So we have to think, what are we doing to document their knowledge? What are we doing to replace the number of speakers that we are losing? What are we doing to maintain the richness and vitality of the language that they carry? Will our second language speakers be as eloquent? Will they know how to describe a very certain state, say of nature, in a way that a native speaker would? Or are we going to lose that? And so what came out of this study was that there's a goal. And everyone agreed on it. They said, our second language speakers will eventually speak like native speakers. You think, all right, that sounds awesome. Do you know how hard that is? Very, very challenging. And so then we had to think, OK, out of the study, what can our speakers do in and with their language? What must our learners be able to do in and with their language? What is a speaker? So speakers spoken to from birth, it's their first language. They are raised within a community of speakers. They use the language out of a necessity to communicate daily. I was at an immersion school. I was hired to evaluate an immersion school. And I had a bunch of their teachers in this room. There's about 20 of them. And I said, what is Mohawk for? What is Ganyak Geha for? What is Ganyak Geha the language of access to? What does being a speaker of Ganyak Geha give you? Guess how many answers there were? And they all sat there and looked at each other. And then one person said, oh, the culture. It gives you access to the culture. So if I asked somebody at Clinkit, I said, what does Clinkit, what does that, if you're a speaker of Clinkit, what does it give you access to? What is it the language of access to? No one answered. I'm just theoretically thinking out loud here. And so I asked them that, and there was silence. And I wasn't surprised. And I said, OK, you also teach English here. What is English the language of access to? Employment, mobility, post-secondary education, money, a good life, sports teams, all these different things. Communication, interaction with your family. They also teach French there, I said. What does French give you access to? And they listed off a bunch of the same things. And then I came back around again, and I said, what does Ganyang Geha give you access to? Crickets again. If we want our languages to live, we need to know why we're going to speak them. What does speaking our languages give us access to? The days are gone where you can tell a five-year-old, um, you need to learn to speak our language or else it's going to die forever. That little five-year-old just crushed. They just want to have fun and hang out with their pals and play sports and run around in the woods, swim in the creek. So to get back to this, 
They speak the language of their homes or communities. So we have ethnic Mohawks who speak Kyuga because one of their parents spoke Kyuga in the home. I'm not sure if any of you, any of you come from multilingual communities where you have more than one language. Okay, so whatever the dominant language was in the home, that's what people at Six Nations speak. Regardless of that's who they are, their national affiliation is. Their process is natural and language use transcends symbolic functions, meaning they use the language for more than uh, recited speeches. So, who is a speaker of Ungwahomaneha? A learner who has become a speaker is, they have achieved the advanced mid-level of proficiency. They are able to interact effectively in a community of speakers. And how we test this out is, um, we can send them to our eastern communities near Montreal. And there are still speakers there, 932 of them that they can interact with. And that number is dropping pretty much almost every day. They use the language out of necessity to communicate daily. If you ask someone, one of your adult learners, why do you want to learn to speak Tlingit? If they don't say to communicate, if you have something you can throw at them, or but it, it's something for you to ask them, why do you want to learn to speak this? It's because it's supposed to be who I am. So it doesn't die forever. Yes, all of that, but how are you going to use it today? Why is it useful to you? So we're always working to acquire native speaker like semantics, syntax, prosody, pragmatics. How we're going to learn, it's not natural. It's not the way you're going to learn. Transcend symbolic functions. So we have many, many young people who can stand up in our longhouses and recite these hour-long speeches and two-hour-long songs, all in Onondaga or Kyuga or Mohawk, but that doesn't make them speakers of our languages. Our people agreed on that. They need to be able to do more. All those, those things are very, very important. So now a language learner, they're working towards advanced mid. We want them to be able to interact in a community of speakers. They need to use the language daily to communicate their wants, needs, thoughts, and feelings. They should eventually sound like native speakers. They're learning in an unnatural process. And they can use the language for symbolic functions. We know that our successful language learners know a lot of these speeches for our long haul. So it's a useful tool. The importance of knowing all this, this guides your instruction. This guides your second language acquisition process. Our people think it's important that our speakers are very proficient. Our people think that it's very important that they can interact in a community of speakers. Who wants to talk to themselves? <laughs> like, what good is your language if you, all you can do is talk to yourself? Our people always work together, and so we'll use our language together. You want to use the language because you want to communicate who you are to someone else in that language. You choose that language. That's different than saying, speak that language. Two different things. This here, we're going to honor our speakers who have gone before. We're going to try to maintain it in the way that they pass it down to us. That's a really important cultural uh, aspect for us. Unnatural. Our older people who still speak need to know that we are working towards what you have and what you can do. Please be patient with us and help us on the way. We're not learning how you learn. But we can use, if you know your second language acquisition process, you can explain it to your older people. Also, we have a community as Six Nations, we're very fortunate. Um, we still have funerals, births, weddings, these big longhouse ceremonies, feasts in the houses that are expected to be conducted in Mohawk or Cayuga. So there's an actual community that if all the money stopped tomorrow, if all the funding quit, if all the programs ended, you could still go and hear our language being used in the community. And I think that would continue on forever. So out of this study, we also found three paths. Was anybody there in Juneau two years ago 
when I gave a talk about maybe conducting this study. Is anybody there? Gune. Okay, these are the study results. So we found there were three ways people became speakers of our languages. The first path took 15 to 20 years. Now we're looking for the most efficient, expedient path to be creating speakers. There are many different ways to become a speaker. Not every way is right for every person. So 15 to 20 years. These people grew up in houses where they had someone who <coughs> spoke the language. They participated in church when they were younger and then in long haul ceremonies when they were older. They both, these guys here, taught in an immersion setting. And they resided or worked with native speakers. Now, this batch of people who became speakers would have started in the late 70s through the 80s into the early 90s. Path two, you see there's Wanadeka and myself, 10 years or more. Elementary and high school NSL courses. Did you know the 20 to 40 minute snippets you get every day in the English school? That helps. It helps, it really does. Don't ever think if someone's teaching 20 minutes of UPIC in an English school, ah, oh, you take the Augusta, that's not good for anything. It is, this study showed us that that actually is good for something. They participate in long haul ceremonies, feasts, and other community functions. Some of this is going to start sounding familiar. Adult immersion, one year. Nine months, full time, about 900 hours of intense, focused, second language instruction. Mm -hmm. Residing, working, mentoring with a native speaker. For myself, I dropped out of two universities at once when I was 19 to move in with an elder speaker to learn to speak Mohawk better. My parents were delighted. <laughs> yeah. And then I had to leave my home reserve to move to Six Nations to attend Brian's Adult Immersion <coughs> Program. And I had been there ever since. So I had to leave my home community where I grew up hunting, fishing, doing all these things, all my friends. Um, so when they were, the Hawaiians were talking about you have to make change and make sacrifice, that's, that's exactly what it takes. Extended self-guided study. So after the one year immersion, these people here went and spent time with speakers. Now this one threw the whole study for a loop. You see the time? Five years. Usually you do research and you kind of know what you're going to come out with at the end. This one I did not anticipate, did not expect. It was a welcome surprise. Five years, we can see that these people are in their, mostly in their early 20s. Um, some of them didn't grow up on the reserve, they grew up in cities, which is really strange <laughs> for us because we have our reserves. And you think, well, what did they do? The first thing they did, they were motivated or inspired from a speaker at a community event. A lot of them, um, some of them saw some of our other speakers in the community talking with their kids at the, at the arena and they thought, hey, I can do that. Or they're at the longhouse and they heard someone give a speech and they thought, that was awesome. I wish I knew what they were saying. Because you can feel it, right? And, and they said, I want to be a speaker too. These guys were lucky enough to have adult immersion for three whole years, around 3,000 hours of direct focus instruction. In research literature, there is a direct association between length of time spent engaged in language learning and second language acquisition. The more time you spend doing it, the more proficient you become. So we know that our, our university courses that we have are insufficient to create speakers. That's about 15 hours a week. It's, it's not enough time. These guys use language on social media. They text, Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, chat groups, memes, everything, all on Mohawk. We think, ah, oh, interesting. 
This has yet to inform instruction in most places. It's called social media language learning. That you look at your students, you think, okay, who are these people? See, I look at you now, what, one, two, three, four, five, six. I can see you with your phones. That's who you are today. When we teach our language to our students, we need to recognize who they are. We think, ah, okay, why aren't we using social media to teach our languages? Maybe some people are. That, to me, I think is one of the next big things in language teaching. I'm a teacher by trade, by the way. Um, these people participate in longhouse ceremonies, feasts, and other community functions, even if they didn't, weren't raised as longhouse people. They go anyway, because they get to hear the language. They went to school with their friends, people they like. One of the findings of this study is if you uh, learn the language with a family member or a friend, you actually progress further than people who do not. And these people also reside, work, or mentor with native speakers. So this one guy here, I swear every day he calls me just to talk Mohawk with someone. My wife says, why is, that? Why is he always calling me? I said, oh, well, you want someone to speak Ngwahongwe Neha with. She's like, you know, Deho, you're always saying you want someone to speak Kanyangeha with. And I said, OK. These people are persistent to the point where you're like, oh, I need a break from you. <laughs> but I know what they're doing. And I remember when I was that age, I was the exact same way. And I know if they keep that up, then they will also be speakers too. So the other part, these people create things that are new in the language that reflect who they are as an individual person in today's contemporary world. I taught these, some of these students here in the third year of the adult immersion, and they had me teaching them long haul ceremonial speeches. And that's a very formal language that's only used in very uh, specific circumstances. And I remember trying to explain one sentence to them. I drew pictures. I used simple, everyday, plain language. I thought, they're not getting it. So I tried to teach it to them another way. I followed them one day on break. I was like, I wonder what they're talking about. <laughs> oh man, let's go eat pho tonight. Then I'm going to the skate park. Then I'm going to this. I was like, yeah. That's what you talk about? I looked through my whole syllabus. Guess how much of that was in there? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> they didn't get it because it's not who they are right now. It's not familiar to them. So the study found that language use coupled with Proficiency development are the two most important factors in creating speakers. When you build proficiency, it gives your learners the ability to use the language in real community. Um, that's kind of what came out of the study. And I'm gonna, I can email this to all of you. Yeah. It, we don't have a lot of time. It's a lot to cover and, and, and not a lot of time. If you have questions, please write them down. At the end, I'll ask for questions. And I can go back. Just trying to get through the whole thing first. And so this is the actophil cone. If Keiki was here, she would love it. She's like, oh, there's a graphic. <laughs> We can see novice, low, mid, high, intermediate, low, mid, high, advanced, low, advanced, mid, advanced, mid. That's the goal. So if we look on the left at the bottom here, a novice level speaker sounds like a parrot. They say single words, memorize phrases. Um, they can list things. They can ask and answer simple questions. Can I go to the bathroom? What time can I go home? Um, do I have to do this? Um, that my name is so-and-so. That's novice level speech. They sound like a parrot. The next level, intermediate, is speaking in the level of sentences. So we think about our polysynthetic languages, the novice level alone, just to surpass that, you have to know how to build and create words for yourself at a certain level. English does not have that. 
French does not have that. Most of our languages have that, and we need to take that into consideration. <coughs> so as we progress up, these people can talk about daily life, everything that goes on in the house, personal needs, wants, that sort of thing. We go up to advanced. These people sound like reporters or storytellers. They can tell things that happen in all major time frames, which we know for our polysynthetic languages is very, very complicated. Very complicated. Superior, we're not even going to talk about that today. So we look at this. This one here, that says accuracy. This says fluency, build, proficiency. So the four young people who were on the stage yesterday, one of them mentioned there was a focus on developing fluency. So we know if we put our learners with our elders, they're going to be saying a lot. They're going to be talking a lot. Are they accurate? No. Can they take and change the words around? Nope. They have to memorize every single sentence combination, morphe, morphological construction for every single exact situation. And for our languages, there are millions of those. It's an impossible task. So, but if we pair them with the native speaker, they get to build their pronunciation. They learn the culture of how to speak appropriately in the language. They get to see different levels of formality. They get to hear different levels of specif specificity in word choice and usage in the language. And so taking those two things together with this grammatical accuracy, we get proficient speakers. Learners go through this other process called interlanguage, where at the start, they don't sound like native speakers. They make a lot of mistakes. They screw everything up constantly. We laugh at them. But we keep encouraging them. <laughs> and they're eventually working towards sounding like a speaker. To sum all this up, what have learners who have become speakers done to become proficient? The most effective instructional framework in our experience of the last 60 years has been adult immersion followed by self-guided study with native speakers, like a master apprentice style, after the immersion. We know our people who learn solely from native speakers, it took them 15 to 20 years to become speakers. So we have motivation, adult immersion three years, language use on social media. They go to our long houses and participate in our feasts and dances. They have friends who also speak Ganyangeha. This is the change we're talking about. You change your group of friends. Change the people you hang around with. Even family. We don't go visit them very much anymore because all they speak is English. We go visit these people who speak Mohawk. And think about how drastic that is. We moved from our home community to go to a place where there are other speakers. That's change and it's hard. So the big thing that came out of this study is this. This is the language acquisition process for second language learners of one of the Six Nations languages. So the first stage is someone who's a beginner. They become motivated or inspired to learn to speak the language. That is critical. Whenever times get hard, whenever you're sitting there in front of a native speaker and they're looking at you going, what are you saying? And you just get deflated. And you go home, you bawl your eyes out. You come back to that motivation. I am learning because I remember my great grandfather who spoke to me when I was a little guy. And I want to honor him, and I'm going to learn to speak our language. That's what keeps you going. Stage two is building a base. So this is where you learn to read and write the language. You might learn to pronounce some sounds. You might learn some songs. Uh, you might learn a couple little stories. You know what it's supposed to sound like. The most effective programs for this were the NSL programs, um, college and university programs, master apprentice, that sort of thing. 900 hours. If you add up K to 8, 10 years of elementary education of 40 minutes per day, 
it doesn't even equal that. <coughs> Time is huge. Stage three, so you can see your novice there. Stage three, exponential acquisition. English doesn't have this stage. In order for us to be able to speak our languages, we have to know how to build words. Even before we put those words in the right order. English doesn't have that step. So we have to think about how we're going to teach our languages in a different way. See, 1,800 hours, that's basically two full years of Monday to Friday, 8.30 till 3.30 p.m., everyday instruction in an adult or elementary immersion program where all you're doing is teaching people how to speak the language. That doesn't include science or math or ceremonial speeches or songs. That's just the language. This stage is crucial. If you don't teach to this stage, your learners very rarely will get to the advanced level, stage four, in our experience. Very, very rare. So this stage here, advanced, then this is where we would pair them with native speakers. They're ready. <clears throat> They're going to get more out of it. We're going to make the most efficient use of our speakers' time we can by putting them with people who can um, pick up the language from them. If you put a rote beginner with a native speaker, it's, it's really uh, fun and cool, but how much are they actually going to learn? 15 to 20 years. That's how long that takes. Us, our speakers are going to be gone probably in the next five years. And then this stage here, finishing off. 3,600 hours, four years full time, you're starting to sound like a speaker. When you talk, they can't differentiate that you're not a second language speaker. They'll say, who's your parents? You tell them who they are and they say, I don't know them. Do they speak? No. Nope. Who's your grandparents? Did they raise you? And you say, no. Nope. And then they're like, well, who taught you how to speak the language? That's what we want to go for. That's this stage here. 3,600 hours, four years full time. So this stage three, I want to explain it to you. This is the stage we weren't using until 1998. This is the stage that most of our elders and other people are reluctant to engage with. Stage three. It's not natural. That's not how you speak the language. You can't do that. Other people are taught the stage three, and they go speak to native speakers, and they're like, wow, you speak good Mohawk. Who taught you how to speak? So you can see both sides of it. Now, in stage three, if, let's say you clink it, you have your linguists, over the last hundred years have put together a complete morphology and grammar of your language. You're halfway there. Brian will be talking about how to take that information and to put it into an order to teach your learners by these different stages, novice, intermediate, advanced, to get them to be speakers. That presentation is when? One of Deca? At three o'clock today. So you, what you want to do, they're called structures. I'm going to show you what they are. Phonemes, the little sounds of your language, how to pronounce them all, and how to actually sound like a speaker when you're doing it. Very, very hard. This is necessary, or else the speakers will always laugh at you. Morphemes, the little wee parts and pieces. If I change one, it changes the meaning of the whole word. So we have here, Nino, I can say, Knino, Kninos, I'm buying. I can say, Wak Nino, I have bought. Wak Nino, I did buy. Onk Nino, I will buy. Waha Nino, he did buy. It's magic. Let the students build the language and say what they want to say for themselves. 
Lexemes are words. Now, native speakers know which words exist. They also know which words can exist. That's why having native speakers is one advantage that you have here. Um, well, it is really good. <coughs> Syntax, word order. For languages like English, they just have to learn how to say the words and how to put them in the right order. For us, we have to learn how to build the words first, then how to put them in the right order. And we can see that one little change changes the meaning. Yes, the cat. Honda goes. Ha, tigo da goes. Yes, that cat. Ha, tigo ne da goes. Yes, that's the cat. You see this one little word changes the meaning. So our students need to master that. Context is also very important. How all these structures come together to make meaning. And the example I like to give, if you don't, if you just teach grammar rules and you just teach how to build words and put words together, the students say things that don't quote unquote sound right. They're not polite in the language. They don't know how to talk to someone sometimes who's older than them. They don't know how to be formal. Um, I'm going to do another presentation about, uh, about these sorts of things uh, after this one in the same room. So we have an example here. Two friends meet up and they're like, hey, Sigordi. Hey, Sigyaze. Very informal, very slangy. You would not walk up to an elder that you don't really know and talk to them like that. <laughs> but some of our language learners do because they don't know any better. The model uh, hasn't been provided for them. So we always have to think we can have all the parts and pieces, but if we don't have a context for language use, we're missing a very important part. This is what our native speakers carry. So we have down here, Segon, skanak goaga, ah, skanak goak nise, ah, skanak goa nitne. It's very formal. And that would be appropriate to talk to a, an older person in that way. So why is it important to know all that? If I'm going to teach someone to become a speaker of my language <clears throat> at the novice level, sounds, parts and pieces, words, that's what they're going to learn here. My whole first year of my program will be geared towards that. My second year, syntax, how to take the words they can now build and put them into sentences. Questions, answers. Third year, <coughs> advanced. How to bring it all together. This is the language acquisition process, the most efficient way for Mohawk. What also came out of the study is the most effective process for teaching these learners these structures. So if we start at the top here, structural functional syllabus. Yeah. You take all the structures of your language, you put them in an order from most from easiest to most difficult. Then you teach them through interaction, meaning there's no papers and pens. You're doing a lot of drills, it's out loud. Your teachers are showing you how the language works. You might be watching a short video of some elders talking. Um, then your teachers are drilling you. They're giving you all these little tasks to do in the language where you have to use the language. So we have task-based learning. Then you want to keep giving your learners opportunities to use the language for real, not just memorize patterns, not just re regurgitate sentences. You want to bring them to breakdown. The more you have to think about what to say in a certain situation, the faster it will come out the next time you're in that situation. So we want to put our learners in as many challenging situations as possible to build automaticity. The language just falls out. Instead of going, OK, oh, OK, that's the will. OK, yeah, Nino, that's to buy you. Oh, Nino, oh, Gosri, OK, where does that go? Gosri, oh, Nino, OK. I think that's right. Gazri and Nina. Sound familiar? Right. So we want to push them, our learners, to break down. Then we want to knock them down, then we're going to pick them back up and dust them off. Feedback. I will be doing a presentation on this. Is that today? 
Summative evaluation is the presentation on Thursday about the oral proficiency interviews. So, this is the last part of the study. We want to know, okay, so we have these structures. We want to teach, or we know our learners need to master them in order to achieve the advanced level of proficiency. Right? Is everybody with me still? Okay. Now, through these focus group meetings, 104 teachers of Cayuga, Onondaga, and Mohawk said, I think there's 17. When we teach our learners to speak our language, these are the things that they need to know how to master. Phonology, sounds, the orthography, how to read and write, syllables, phonics. Second thing, morphology. All those little parts and pieces. And yes, you can teach them all. Words. They can't just build everything because there are, are already set ways to say everything. And our native speakers know what those are. Challenging. Syntax, sentence structure, word order, particle word usage, negation. There's some very, um, if I'm telling you what I heard someone else say, if I heard someone else say it, you use a certain set of particle words. If it's a story that that person told me they heard someone else say, I uh, can use different particle words. If it's a traditional story that's passed down through generations, then there are different particle word combinations that are used for those. That's what speakers have. That's what we want to give our learners. Mm -hmm. Semantics. To actually mean what you think you are saying. You, this is challenging because we teach our second language learners to communicate. And sometimes they don't use the right quote unquote word. For, for semantics, we might teach them in year one, say, I will help. So anytime they want to help anyone with anything, they say, if we teach them to say, I fell, that means to fall off of something like this. To be more specific, there's also I fell over. There's I fell on my back. I fell on my stomach. There's 25 different words to describe how you fall. And they're all different roots, verb roots. So we think about lexical knowledge and words and semantics. That's what we're building in this second language acquisition process. So we increase our learners' specificity in the language as they become more proficient. They wouldn't just use that one overall encompassing crutch word. They're going to learn all these other little fine-tuned ways to say it. Um, the reason these are important, too, is because now you can assess. When you're talking with one of your learners, whoa, he just used a real fancy word and he used it right. Wow, that's an advanced level skill. He just told a whole story in the conditional future and it's all correct. Wow. That's an advanced level skill. So we can use this to assess where our learners are at. You learners, you can also use it to assess where you are at. Pragmatics. Now, we've heard for the last, I'm 41, I've been hearing for 35 years probably, the culture is in the language. So we've been taught songs, dances, how to make moccasins, how to tan a deer hide, how to plant corn beans and squash, how to make a garden, how to make medicine from your, for your seeds that you're going to plant. We're taught all these things, but you know what? I still couldn't speak Mohawk. So we say the culture is in the language. Teach the culture. So for about 25 years, my people focused on teaching the culture. And in most of our elementary immersion schools, they're still teaching the culture. How many of those kids speak the language? Pragmatics is a generally new term. It means the culture of speaking your language. You know, I'm up here going like this. We don't do that in Mohawk. So they got Ungwa Homaneha, the Guatarha say, Gonia Ji Ongede. 
They all not got the ganyak geha ya intonation tagat stock. I don't use intonation when I speak Mohawk. In English, I'm using it all the time. I'm using my hands, so I don't know what else to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> this is pragmatics. I watched, um, my friend had a video and he gave these two elders, three elders a, a role play card. It says, introduce your friend to your boss. And so they use certain language. Then he gave them another role play card that said, introduce your coworker to your mother. And then it was different language again. The third time, they gave him the card that said, introduce your best friend to your friend. And so these two older speakers sat there and they talked about that person like they weren't even sitting there. Now in English, that's very rude. But in Ganyang Geha, by watching that video, we know that that is appropriate culturally. So the importance of elicitation for specific purposes is critical um, to help your learners become speakers. We have turn taking, cultural norms. Do you cut people off when they're speaking? Is that OK? Is there a certain way that you do that? That's pragmatics. Um, prosody, your accent. I could never develop like a Gitsan accent or a Klinkit accent. I can't make that sound. I don't even think with a lot of practice, I probably couldn't make that sound. Give me 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> Tenure, yes. So we'll keep going. Meta linguistic awareness. So this is what Pila was talking about when he said, if you want your kids to learn to speak Hawaiian, send them to China. Because when they go there, it shows them, ah, that language has a different set of rules. That language has a different culture, the way people speak it. Ah, that language has different sounds. It reflects to you, it raises your awareness of language, in period. And so by teaching structures, we build the metalinguistic awareness of our learners. Metacognitive awareness, just by knowing your second language acquisition process, you can tell your learners, this, these are the stages that you're going to go through. The, this is how we're going to teach you when you're in that stage. These are the things that you need to master in order to go from intermediate to advanced. And when we do that, we build their metacognitive awareness. If you play hockey and you know um, your backhand sucks, you can't get the puck up on your backhand, you think, ah, I need to practice my backhand. <coughs> right? If you're a hunter and you're in the bush, you have an opening, the moose comes out, boom, you can shoot him. But if that moose is running through the bush and you miss him all the time, well, then you know you need to practice that. So this metacognitive awareness, it like uh, learners themselves recognize where they're strengths are and where their weaknesses are. Language use. Who's a teacher here of language? OK, so you want to get your learners to use the language. On break, they sneak out. You can go to the window. You can crack the window open. They go into the other room. You put your glass on the door. And you're listening. Are they using the language? Sometimes yes, mostly no. You see them in the community. Are they using the language? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. My kids in my own house, are they using the language? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. How do we get them motivated enough to choose our languages? Communicative competence, now this is a huge, if you Google this, there are a whole bunch of different kinds of communicative Competence. What this means is you have the ability to converse in a whole bunch of different situations. There's social competence. Some people are socially incompetent, right? <laughs> they meet people and they start sweating and ah, turn around and run away. <laughs> Cultural competence. You understand when you go into the longhouse, you don't go sit in the women's end if you're a man. Like you know all these <coughs> customs. Listening comprehension, um, like you have been listening for an hour and five minutes, and I thank you. Literacy, the ability to read and write. 100% of our learners who became speakers are literate in Mohawk and Kyuga. 
and Onondaga. The days of saying, it's an oral language, um, you're just going to remember everything for us. My people are gone. We know that if you want to become a speaker, you have to learn to read and write it. Language learning strategies, you can train your learners how to learn your language most efficiently. So you see Ruben 1990, if you were to Google that, there's a strategy inventory of language learning skills or something. It's a checklist you can do. And there are six categories of these strategies. I did a study in 2005 on the most what do our successful learners use the most? What strategies? The one was metacognitive, so they monitor their own learning process. The second one was affective strategies, meaning they have a support network who picks them back up after they get beaten down by trying to learn our language. Those are the two most critical. Cultural knowledge. This is very important at Six Nations. Our songs, ceremonies, practices, foods, ways of being. Hunting, fish, all the fun stuff. It's in here. <clears throat> so the last two, semiotics, symbols in your language, or symbols of your people. My people use um, embroidery or wampum belts, beads, symbols. Uh, people on the West Coast might use, we have masks too, carved masks that have symbols on them. Clothing has symbols on them. That sort of thing, totem poles. And the most important thing that I think one of the real strengths at Six Nations is the community. Even though we were put on reserves, the expectation was that we would die out, it actually safeguarded our cultural practices. And because Six Nations is the largest reserve population wise in all of Canada, um, the Canadian government sort of kind of left us alone somewhat. So we have this community that if you want to hear Mohawk, you can go to Longhouse. We were just there a few days ago, actually, for planting. You would hear the language. You sit inside people, you speak, you speak Mohawk with them. Um, community is, is really important. So all 16 of those things, that's what your, our learners need to master. As a teacher, now you think, ah, am I teaching pragmatics to my learners? I could incorporate that a little bit more. Am I teaching them all the little parts and pieces, how to build the words? No. Is that this? Yes. All right. OK. So in our learning, you can say, do I know how to offer condolences to someone who has had a death in their family? How many of you know how to do that in your language as learners? OK. There are very specific ways to do that, depending on if it's your same family, your clan, if it's from the opposite side of your house. There are different things you might say to the, those people. Um, so I have these stages up here. So after we master all those structures, the goal at Six Nations is they will sound like native speakers. So we want to maintain the richness and vitality of our native speakers' language. This is where the Master Apprentice program becomes very useful. This is where technology-assisted language learning becomes very useful. This is where computer-assisted language learning becomes very useful. Our speakers are going to be gone, but if we have these 200 videos of them talking about these 200 different things, we can use those to help our learners. Social media language learning. Our kids in the elementary school have pen pals in Gahnawage. And they have chat rooms, and they email back and forth. They text each other in the class. Some of their Classroom assignments, they have to use their cell phones to text each other. Who has kids? How many of your kids have phones? OK, where we are, it's, it's every kid has a phone and a tablet and a game thing that they carry around. And at home, they have another game thing. Yeah. 
So our people are going to use that to meet our kids where they are, uh, to give them our language. So I had some, I'll make time for any questions that you had. If you want me to go back to something that you had a question on, ask away. Yes? Where'd you get the hours from? Adult immersion. Yes. So those hours come from? So we estimated hours. I just figured like 8,000 hours and then the highest level would be the whole See, all the learners that go through the adult immersion program, even if they take the first two years, that's, eight, that's about 2,000 hours, not all the master all the structures. So the one thing I didn't talk about was rate. So rate of acquisition, Every, all of our learners have gone through that process, but they've gone through it at different rates. That one young guy went through it in two years. Boom. So a few of them have done that. Others had to take the first year twice, the second year once. Um, so everyone will acquire the language at a different rate. But in the Mohawk Adult Immersion Program, even the Kugel one, they let them take it again, however long it would take them. Yes, Pilot. Um, regarding hours, the U.S. Foreign Service Institute yes. has a uh, kind of like a fair <laughs> I've seen it, yes. Yeah, and so it tells about what are easier and how much time it takes based on the difference from English. So your language is uh, ah. quite different from English. So it takes more hours based on the similarity to English. And then they also put in the writing system. So like Chinese and Japanese are hard just because of the writing system more so than the other. And they're also different from English. Yes. But I think um, an endangered polysynthetic language, because being endangered makes it more difficult to learn, because you can't go to the country and practice. So right. the hours, I mean, I really support that it takes a lot of time based on the um, nature of the language. Yes. So two things with that. Hang on a Back to fill. OK. The Actifil chart, English, it takes, I think, what is it, 400 hours? They're, they have diff they have five classes of languages. The first class of languages are analytic. There's zero polysynthesis. They don't build any words at all. Um, the hours are very low for you to achieve an advanced level of proficiency. Something like, I think it's 1,200. The second level are a little bit more. Third level, a little bit more. The fifth level are Arabic, Korean, Mandarin. Yeah, they're considered the most complex languages in the entire world to learn. 2,700 hours of directed instruction to become an advanced level speaker. Polysynthetic languages, guess where they are on that five level scale? 17. They're not on it. <laughs> We're not even on the scale. Yeah, I took the highest one and I kind of... Yes. I don't know, double, I can't remember what I did. I either doubled it or five times. Yes, so on one of my other presentations, I actually have a slide where I added level six, which would be polysynthetic languages, 3,600 to 4,800 hours. That's five years of full-time study for adults. Now, the reason that that's important and that I reference that in a published study is that you can reference it when you go for funding. When you say, ah, the clink, if we figured it out, we have uh, the second language acquisition process. It has all these stages. Um, it has a stage English doesn't have. Uh, our language is kind of like the Mohawk, it's polysynthetic, we know it takes 4,500 hours. Ah, there's a study by Jay Green in, 19, or in 2017 that says this. 3,600 to 4,800 hours. Four year, five year, full time program. Ah, he has a PhD. Oh wow, let's reference that and put in this proposal. Right? Yes? Yes. Can you talk towards how much linguistics has sort of informed this and ways in which linguistics for Mohawk has been beneficial in sort of coming at these things? Because we're we're constantly learning more about the syntax, for example. 
Uh -huh. Wow. Okay. So, um, Mohawk and Iroquois languages are some of the most written about and well documented languages in North America. So, linguists have been looking at us for a long time. And they have this thing for nouns. <laughs> Noun incorporation, they're all about it. And we're like, nouns are the least used form of words in our language. But in English, which is most of these. Linguist's first language, nouns are everything. They have to name everything in order to own it, right? Mm. <laughs> really? <laughs> He's like... <laughs> so a lot of their work has informed our teaching practice. Where we think, okay, we threw all these kids in this room with two native speakers, why are they still talking English? They've had native speaking teachers since kindergarten. They're graduating grade 12. Why are they all still speaking English? Why are they still talking baby talk in Mohawk? And then we had to think about that. And then we look at what the linguists have done. Oh, OK, there's all these rules. Do those kids know? No, they're still all using the command form, you, you, everything. Right? So it's informed our work in that way. The other way is that basically our grammar and morphology has been done for us by someone else and finished off, is being finished off now by our own people. So we don't have to start from scratch. That is very, very beneficial. So if you go listen to Brian's presentation, he's going to talk about how you take these texts, maybe the linguists have done, the dictionaries, how to actually make a dictionary that's easy to use for your learners and for your language that's organized around roots, not words. Um, that's how it has been useful. Does that answer your question? OK, awesome. Yes? Is there, um, so you're talking about Mohawk being polysynthetic. Is, are there very many changes that happen to your morphemes as you add them together? Is it very morphophonological? Um, some of the accents change, but the morphemes themselves generally stay the same. Do In a do, nutshell. Do, do you do another study for UPIC, which is polysynthetic and morphophonological? <laughs> Me? <laughs> I would come help you, yes, if they wanted that. But a lot of the work probably has already been done. Like it's probably sitting there in dictionaries and books and in your speakers. But um, see, they tried to do it for Oneida, which is a very similar language to Mohawk. So if I, my kids um, can understand Oneida speakers, no problem, because it's that close. But so they tried to make a syllabus for an immersion, adult immersion program simplest to complex. And they kept running into all these bumps. And part of it, I think, was the reluctancy of the native speakers to go along with it. Not natural. That's not how you learn the language. Our language isn't made to be cut up like that. Our language isn't. And so it, it kind of stalled. So this kind of presentation or like education of the unique needs of second language learners can be very helpful to that regard to say, listen, uh, our very valued older people, we're not throwing you away. Um, but this is a really quick way for us to be able to uh, come to you with a greater language ability to better take in what it is you have to give us. So that would be the work that would have to be done first to build the willingness to want to uh, go at it in that way. It's change. Change uh, generally um, isn't easy. Yeah. <laughs> I'd I just like to support yeah. the thing about going from a grammatical basis um, for both Hawaiian and Maori. I don't think most people realize that in New Zealand, Maori wasn't taught in the university until the 1951 or so, and the guy who was the first professor was sent to Indiana to learn linguistics and came back and figured out the structure of the language and used that as the basis for teaching second language, even first language speakers mm -hmm. about the language. Because they still had first language speakers going to college and learning about the language. And similarly, in Hawaii, what we had been in university from 1924, just trying all different methods, never focusing on grammar. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until we started teaching through grammar that we really began to produce people who are proficient in Hawaii. 
<laughs> so grammar is really important, and it's something that you don't know naturally if you speak a language. You have to study that. Okay. When I okay, let's have uh, when Pila said grammar. What do you think? Have some ideas. When you hear grammar, you think English. textbooks, English. Diagramming. Diagramming. Do you think linguistic terminology? Our adult. Whole new language. So our adult immersion program does not use linguistic terminology. Wanadeka invented his own simplified terminology for all these fancy linguistic words that's in the rhetoric or jargon of the local Six Nations community. We don't want them to learn two languages, we want them to learn one. Yeah. So tomorrow afternoon, I will be having two sessions on how to teach grammar. There's no papers, there's no books, there's no pens, it's all and um, yeah. So to clarify, when you say phonemes, morphemes, syntax, is that, right. That's what I did by grammar. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, everybody has their different ideas of it, right? Yeah. Okay. So we're used to being reading a book and circling a noun and a verb, underlying the subject and the predicate, and I'm asleep by the time I'm halfway through the first sentence. Like. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. What does the course structure look like? For the adult immersion, you'd have to go listen to one of Deca. Brian's talk on it. But basically, it's a lot to explain, but if you would listen and go to send somebody to his or go to his, then you would hear what, it's, what it sounds like. Yeah. Uh, somebody else had their hand up. You and then, I don't know any of your names, sorry, in the back after. Okay, go ahead. The immersion approach came from the French who started it in 1965. They got it from Hebrew, started it in the early 20th century. Um, Ganawagi Mohawk started in 1979. Elementary immersion. Um, from there we watched the French immersion, elementary immersion falter to create proficient speakers. Um, we had learners trying to learn from native speakers, taking 20 years to become proficient, who weren't very proficient. Um, Brian took the adult immersion program they offered in Wakta, which is a Mohawk community. Uh, Ryan DeCare, some of you may be familiar with his name, he's from there, he's their only second language speaker. So Wanadeka took that program and he spent six months there with native speakers and said there must be an easier way to do this. So he went and saw David Maracle at the University of Western Ontario and David Maracle was already teaching this way. This is the mid-90s. From there, Winnedeca parlayed it into this adult immersion program. So that would be the influence on, of the other communities. Now, the influence is now going the other way. So the adult immersion program at Six Nations has spawned a Cuga immersion program, an Onondaga immersion program, who do not use these approaches. Are they getting the same results? No. The Senecas, two, two communities of Seneca Nation people, um, took up the Ongo-Wanaganjokwa approach. They use it the exact same way as being presented here, similar philosophy. Are they getting the same results? Yes. So now the Oneidas are trying to use it. They don't have the training. Tuscaroras will be using the same process. It's influenced Gahnawage, but they're very proud, so they won't say that we were influenced by Six Nations. They'll say, this is what we're doing. But we know that we all influence each other, and we all help each other. And what we do, uh, the more we share, the more uh, it builds what everyone is doing. Akwazasne, they don't have very little. It's really discouraging. But, mm. <clears throat> and What's your name? Andrea. Andrea, you know. So, um, with people that I've worked with and in classes I've taken, something that we come across is when you 
are learning the grammar and you're trying to create your own sentences, like 99% of the time the elder can't understand what you're saying once you've created it, even when you're following the book and you're... So how long did it take for you guys to overcome that and how did you... Because there's so many different ways to say things. Yes. Right. It's just... Um, we're starting to... That's where you spend your year or two in the adult immersion program. And then you like mentor with native speakers. One of the biggest things we've been using is called um, social media language learning. So there are all these television programs that have been translated into Ganyangeha. There are um, some books, um, a lot of media resources where you can watch and you can hear how these sentences go together and the proper quote unquote usage of it. And that's where literacy comes in. It was really huge. You had something to read, even dialogues that were transcribed. Um, those things are helpful. Uh, the biggest thing that's been happening is generally trial and error, where the learners say these things and the speakers go, they'll say, Nohoda Jidong, what do you mean? And they'll say it again. And then they'll, they'll tell them how to say it. That shows the importance of having speakers. The other part of this is, um, when they're teaching in the adult immersion program, they tell the learners, you're learning rules and patterns. It's not always the way native speakers say it. But after, you will learn how native speakers say it. So we had an experiment with a third year program where they get exactly that, what you're talking about. So one of the ways we're experimenting is through um, guided elicitation. So not just having a camera in front of two or three native speakers and saying, tell stories. Here is a role playing card. We want to know how you congratulate someone who just had a new baby. Here's the card. Let's see it. Then they record it. Um, how do you congratulate someone after they won a championship? How do you condole someone who lost a child? How do you, all these different things, right? And then give them the role playing cards and they play it out. And then we watch. So that's kind of what we're experimenting with now. Because we know we're going to lose our speakers, so we have to document in some way that's useful that we know, just like what you said, well, I can build it, but is that really right? Would you find that useful if you had that in your language? Yeah. Right? <laughs> Free online, anywhere in the world. You're out in your boat, pulling your net. How do I say that? Here, quick. There's a video. Yeah. About, um Um, as a way of in a way preservation on the on preserving. Um no one's really talked about it. There was some experimentation with it, but to actually find someone who can write at that level. Yeah. See most of our a lot of our native speakers can't even write the language. Mm -hmm. Um but the second language speakers can, and when they write an article in the newspaper and you read it, and you're like, uh, that's not how you say that, but I know what they mean. It's, it's not the same. Was, um, you know, regarding autotasking? Yes. Um, they had a second publication, I think autotasking notes, and yes. it was years ago. Like almost Yes. Um, but that didn't mean we felt that in autotasking. They had. They had an a couple of articles in Ganyang Geha, but the people, that's a whole other story, but that kind of fell apart. Yeah. yeah. To where it could be useful. Yeah. We're thinking like video and technology is kind of the way to go because we are, like Heather said, uh, we're kind of spread out. So we can use IT technology to link up and connect. So that Candace, uh, what's her name? Vila, Candice. Gaola. Huh? You mean in BC? Yes. Gaola is her last name. Right. G-A-L-A. They're creating these long distance learning platforms and interactive platforms through the internet um, to link native speakers with learners. That's really cool. Then you don't have to get in the car and drive seven hours to Gahnawage through Montreal, through Toronto, just to go visit someone who can speak Mohawk. 
Or going to China. Right. <laughs> or Pelag is sending to China, yeah. Um, oh, okay. I, I don't know how much time you have left, but I think it's really important that people get confused about terminology. Yes. So the word immersion gets really um, confusing because you have immersion, you go for camp for a weekend. Or you have immersion, like they do French immersion in Canada. And that the purpose of French immersion in Canada is for the English speaking people to learn enough French so that they could get a job maybe or say they kind of know French but not turn into the French. Yes. So they only go half day or they always make sure that the English is the stronger language. So if you copy immersion as it's done with French immersion, your outcome will be the children will be more fluent in English because that's what the model is set up for. And they'll know the other one partially for command. They can understand it. They can kind of handle it if they don't have to carry it. Right. So this is why we started using another term for some of our schools in Hawaii, which are not on that. They're based on the old idea that our schools are completely in the language. Like the French schools for the French people in Canada are French medium schools. So we're saying our schools are Hawaiian medium, and it's based on the idea that children come to school already speaking Hawaiian from the home. Right. So that's a really important difference than following simply a model that's made for foreign language learning. Now yes. your Mohawk adult immersion, even though you call it immersion, your goal is to produce a fluent enough speaker that they could reestablish the language of the home <coughs> And you're not teaching it really as a second language, but re-changing it to their primary language. Yes. I mean, that, that's the goal. Nobody's perfect, but that's what you're, it's very different from foreign language learning. We need to lose the term immersion, I think, and rename it something else. I'm not sure what that else is, but because what's happening now is, is it's not the traditional form of immersion. Yeah. which in our experience does not create speakers. Yeah. But what we call adult immersion does. That's why I think our Hawaiian immersion or Hawaiian medium education for children is doing better than some of the other immersion efforts that are following French immersion too closely. Right. There are other successful models in the states. Uh, Two-way <coughs> two dual immersion, it's called. Yeah. Those seem to be getting uh, some pretty impressive results. But those are for world languages that, again, don't have this stage three. So just to close up, I would encourage you to think about what is the second language acquisition process of your language. Um, would it have a benefit for your teachers, your learners, your community, people who are creating your teaching resources and curriculum? people who are documenting your language, the kinds of documentation that they need to elicit, would it be useful? And the links at the start have links to this whole study where it explains in length each one of these stages, uh, explains more about those 16 um, components of speaking proficiency, et cetera, et cetera. So, de guarda no jorados, de wasco anardo, ge, eni lo ge uh, I'm really happy to see so many here. I was kind of surprised. I was wondering, oh, I wonder if anybody's going to show up to my sessions. Uh, so I thank you all for listening. Um, sorry I made you sit for an hour and a half. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Okay, now.